Good evening. Welcome to Chagas Virtual Beef Conference 2020. This evening's webinar is the first in a series of three webinars running this evening and for the next two evenings. All webinars start at 8 a.m. and will run for a maximum of one hour. My name is Michael Slattery and I'm Managing Director of Drummonds. Drummonds is a privately owned feed, seeds and grain merchant headquartered in Clanee County Mead. The origins of our business dates back to 1760, which is something which we are extremely proud of. Drummonds manufactures ruminant feeds in Navin with a strong emphasis on optimizing the inclusion of locally grown wheat, barley, oats, be beans, peas, and oxid ray. We also process cereal seeds in Drogheda, which we market under the Golden Acres brand, and we blend high performance grass seed mixtures under the Green Acres brand, which we distribute nationwide through our trade partners. I wish to thank Pierce Kelly, head of Knowledge Transfer Dry Stock with Chagas, for asking me to chair this evening's webinar. Drummonds, along with other industry partners, sponsor the Chagas Green Acres Calf to Beef program, which is ably managed by Alan Dillon. Drummonds has sponsored this giant program since it started back in March 2016. Drummonds' own technical sales team have, have, have enjoyed and gained a lot of evidence-based knowledge from working alongside Chagas researchers, specialists, and advisors in the promotion of best practice in dairy calf to beef production. In turn, we offer solid advice to our many beef farming customers. The format for this evening's webinar is as follows. We have two top class speakers who are experts in their field. Following the two presentations, there will be an opportunity for you, the audience, to ask questions. Um, there is a, this is a live and interactive webinar and we, we are looking and requesting for audience participation. To ask questions, you need to click on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, write your question and hit return button. We have a large number of viewers attending this evening's webinar and we may not get around to answering all questions. However, Chagas will endeavor to answer all questions on their virtual beef conference webpage over the coming days. Also, each webinar is recorded, is recorded so you can look back if there is something in particular which interested you. The title of this evening's webinar is Achieving Target Performance for Weanlings During Their First Winter. From our experience in Drummond's working closely with beef farmers, on a good number of farms, weanling performance over the first winter fails to hit targets. There are many factors or elements which all need to come together to help achieve top animal performance. These include nutrition, health, housing, and husbandry factors. Beef production is a tight margin business and our, our animals need to perform in their first winter. Losing 20 to 30 kilos of weight gain over the first winter potentially adds 20 to 30 days at the more expensive finishing end in a year's time. Our first presenter this evening is Dr. Mark McGee. Mark is, is a principal research scientist working at Chagas Grange Beef Research Center. Mark's current areas of research include feed efficiency, beef cattle nutrition and feed evaluation, along with various aspects of grass-based beef production systems. The title of Mark's paper this evening is Optimum Growth Rate for Weanlings Beef Cattle, for Weanling Beef Cattle During the Winter Housing Period. Over to you, Mark. Uh, th thank you, Michael. Um, I'll just start up the, the presentation now. Okay. Okay, good afternoon or good evening, everybody. Um, as Michael said, uh, the title of my presentation is uh, Optimum Growth Rate for Weanling Beef Cattle During the Winter Housing Period. Uh, the presentation outline is um, in terms of uh, feeding weanlings, we're going to be looking at winter growth rates versus subsequent growth at pasture. We're going to be looking at compensatory growth then we're going to talk a little bit about achieving our, what the target growth, winter growth rate is and achieving that in terms of silage digestibility and concentrate supplementation. We're also going to look at protein supplementation and concentrate feed ingredients. Okay, so just by way of introduction then, as beef producers, we're all in the business of converting feed to animal product as cost efficiently as possible. 
Feed provision is the single largest variable cost within our production systems. So consequently, any, any impact we have in this area can have a large impact on profitability of our systems. Within grass-based beef systems, um, we're all well aware that grazed grass is our cheapest feedstuff and concentrates is most expensive with conserved forages somewhere in the middle. So consequently, within our systems, we try to maximize the inclusion of grazed grass and performance from grazed grass. We try to minimize the contribution of concentrates and optimize our conserved forages produced within the farm gate. So when we talk about feeding uh, weanlings for the first winter, we really cannot talk about uh, the winter period in isolation. We must also look at the performance during the subsequent uh, grazing season. And the reason for that is outlined in the following slides. For example, in, the, in this uh, slide here, we have uh, compiled a number of experiments where we've looked at a wide range in uh, winter average daily gains, going from just uh, over 200 grams per day up to over a kilogram live weight per day. And we achieved this by feeding a range of concentrates going from zero up to about five kilograms per day. We then turned these animals out to pasture and we looked at their performance at pasture and we related this performance at pasture to their winter average daily gain. And what we found is that there's a negative or inverse relationship between winter average daily gain and subsequent performance at pasture. In other words, slower growth rate during the indoor winter period, uh, or should I say animals growing at a slower growth rate during the uh, indoor winter period, it results in a faster growth rate during the grazing season. And this phenomenon is known as compensatory growth. So what do we mean by compensatory growth? Well, compensatory growth is the ability of an animal to undergo accelerated growth when offered unrestricted access to high quality feed after a period of restricted feed, feeding or undernutrition. In practice then, exploitation of compensatory growth within our, our systems means that weanlings have a restricted live weight gain over the expensive indoor winter period and an accelerated growth during the subsequent grazing season while consuming high value, lower cost pasture. So in effect, what we're doing is we're transferring uh, more expensive feed costs uh, into our lower cost uh, phase of the production system. So what is the optimal uh, growth rate uh, for uh, weanlings during the first winter? In this slide, series of slides, we're looking at um, dairy bred weanling steers, and we've compiled a, a number of experiments where we've looked at a range in growth rates, uh, going from 270 grams per day up to almost a kilogram live weight per day. We achieved this by feeding a range of concentrates going from zero up to four kilograms uh, per head per day. And this was a, these were as a supplement to high digestibility grass silage. Where we fed zero concentrates, we were getting a live weight gain of about 270 grams per day. Where we fed a kilogram of concentrates, we achieved about a half a kilogram live weight per day. Over here, where we're feeding four kilograms of concentrates, we're achieving almost a kilogram per day. When we turned these animals out to pasture then, we found that the animals with the uh, low, uh, zero to low uh, concentrate feeding levels had average daily gains at pasture approaching a kilogram live weight per day. However, their counterparts who received the high level of concentrate during the winter were only gaining about 730 grams per day. So a substantial difference in performance at pasture. When we add, uh, when we quantify this then in terms of live weight gain, total live weight gain during the winter and during the grazing season, and this is for a 130 day winter and a 210 day grazing season, we find, for example, that the animals who received zero concentrates during the winter gained 35 kilograms of live weight during the, during the winter. And when they were turned out to pasture, they gained 215 kilograms during the, during the grazing season. Animals that received six, uh, one kilogram of concentrate per head per day gained 65 kilograms during the winter. And when they were turned out to pasture, they gained 204 kilograms of live weight. Their counterparts, for example, who were fed the four kilograms of concentrate during the winter period, gained 125 kilograms over the winter, but only 154 during the grazing season. So when we add these two bars together, the total, and we look at the total of winter and pasture live weight gain, we find that we get a reasonably substantial increase from going from zero to one kilogram of concentrate, which equates to 500 grams per day. 
But after that, the response diminishes dr dramatically, such that there was no advantage at all from feeding greater than two kilograms of concentrates. So in effect, if we compare our two kilogram of concentrate versus our four kilogram of concentrate, we have in effect, we fed a quarter of a ton of meal and got no performance advantage when you look at the combined winter plus pasture live weight gain. So consequently, we can conclude from this that the optimal growth rate uh, under these conditions is somewhere in the order of five to 600 grams per day. So this, these data were generated using dairy bred weanling steers. What do we find with suckler uh, progeny? In this slide, we're looking at the performance of suckler steer and heifer weanlings. Is there an advantage for these animals to be grown at greater than say five or 600 grams per day? So in this experiment, for example, we fed two concentrate winter feed levels, a half and one and a half kilograms per day over the winter. The animals on the half a kilogram per day gained 570 grams per day. Those on the one and a half kilograms per day gained almost 800 grams per day, such that by the end of the first winter, there was a 23 kilogram difference in live weight in favor of the high concentrate feed level. However, when we turned these animals out to pasture then, we found that the animals that were going slowly during the winter had a much faster growth rate or a greater growth rate at pasture, such that by the middle of the grazing season, the 23 kilogram difference in live weight had reduced down to seven. And by the end of the grazing season, it had reduced further down to four. So in effect, this here is the compensatory growth effect where animals catch up following a period of relative undernutrition. And essentially, um, the difference in growth rate over the winter is largely, uh, largely gone by the end of the grazing season. And this slide here, we're comparing two experiments, the experiment in the previous slide and another one, uh, where we're looking at a half and one and a half kilograms of live weight or kilograms of concentrate per head per day over the winter period. And again, just to, to, to recap, our uh, animals on the half a kilogram growing at about 0.56 kilograms of live weight per day of age or per day uh, during the winter and that experiment and 0.57 here. Whereas those getting the one and a half kilograms of concentrate in the red bar growing at about 0.72 here and 0.79 here. So at the end of the first winter, the animals receiving the higher level of concentrate were 20 kilograms heavier, but they're underperformed during the grazing season, so minus 16. So in effect, we have a net gain of only four kilograms. So our 20 kilograms ends up as four. In this experiment, again, we have our plus 24 kilograms of a difference at the end of the first winter. The underperformed those that received the higher level of concentrate during the winter underperformed, relatively speaking, during the grazing season, resulting in just a net gain of plus seven. So clearly, this, uh, the effect also applies to suckler uh, bred progeny. What about suckler bull weanlings? Does the same hold for those? And these are high growth potential animals. In this experiment, we're looking at the performance of suckler bull weanlings offered high digestibility grass silage. We fed three levels of concentrate, two, four, and six kilograms per day over the winter. We can see here on this graph that as we increase the concentrate feed level, we get a decline in grass silage dry matter intake, that's in the yellow bar, but we get an increase in total intake, as you'd expect. So we have a substitution effect occurring here, but we increase total intake and total energy intake by the increased concentrate level. So what, or how do those animals perform? Well, during the first winter, those that received the two kilograms of concentrate gained about 650 grams per day. Those that received the four kilograms gained 900 grams per day. And those that received the six kilograms gained almost 1.2 kilograms per day. So high performing animals. When we turn them out to pasture though, we find similar to the previous slides that essentially the animals that were only received the two kilograms of concentrate during the first winter had the highest growth performance, just under 1.2 kilograms per day. Those that received the four and the six had substantially poor uh, performance during, uh, uh, during the grazing. Um, and there was no difference between, be between each of those. Note here again that we're only at pasture here for 100 days, so it's just half a grazing season. So when we quantify it again then in terms of absolute live weight gains, so feeding four kilograms versus two kilograms, we got an additional 30 kilograms uh, difference in live weight. And when we fed six kilograms versus two kilograms, we got an additional 63 kilograms live weight at the end of the first winter. However, when we look at the performance 
100 days later at grass, essentially the 30 kilograms had disappeared down to minus three. So in this case, we fed 250 kilograms of concentrate during the winter and we got no response to it at all. And our 63 kilograms from, from the six kilograms of concentrate had declined down to 21. So in this case, we fed a half a ton a meal and we only got 21 kilograms difference in live weight gain. So a very poor response. So it, this clearly shows that there's little point in overfeeding weanlings, any class of weanling, dairy bread, suckler bread, even suckler bulls. The same principle holds that essentially due to compensatory growth, a lot of the advantage of overfeeding or excessive growth during the winter in excess of say 0 0.6 of a kilogram per day is largely uh, disappears uh, during, during the grazing season. So our target live weight gain, again, is about 0.5 to 0.6 kilograms of live weight during the, during the winter period. And that largely holds for all classes of animal. So in terms of uh, meeting the animal nutrient requirements, so animals have requirements for energy, protein, minerals, and vitamins. As a starting point, we need to know the forest nutritive value. So there's no point in trying to uh, um, organize a feeding regime for these cattle unless we know the quality of the forage that we're offering. So at a minimum, we need to know the dry matter digestibility of the silage on offer. Once we know that, then we can put in place a feeding regime to achieve our target. And in this table, we just summarize the effect of silage, um, the, the effect of silage dry matter digestibility on concentrate requirements to achieve our target of 0.55 kilograms per day. We can see here that where you have very good silage, for example, a dry matter digestibility of 75%, we only need about a zero to, to one kilogram of concentrate per day to achieve that target. However, when we have very poor quality silage, for example, a DMD of 60, we need in the order of three kilograms of concentrates per head per day to achieve our target. Again, this emphasizes the importance of high nutritive value grass silage for growing cattle. It's the starting point on, in any uh, winter feeding regime. Again, to bear in mind, uh, with the flip side of this, the cattle growing too slowly during winter will not compensate sufficiently at pasture and will not meet performance targets. Okay, so the optimum is somewhere there in the order of 0.5 to 0.6, but if they're growing much less than that, they will, they will, uh, they will not compensate sufficiently and will not meet performance targets. So a little bit about protein supplementation then. Um, in this uh, slide, we're summarizing three experiments with dairy bred weanling steers. Um, we're essentially looking at, is it worth supplementing barley as our control ration? Is it, is it worth supplementing barley with a protein source, in this case, soybean meal? And do we get a performance response to that? In these experiments, we're feeding silage that's of relatively good digestibility relative low to moderate or should I say moderate to high levels of crude protein and the concentrate feeding levels are a little bit higher than we would normally feed in practice but this is for experimental reasons. So in the yellow bar we have our barley, in the brown bars we have uh, our barley plus protein. So in effect we have a, a relatively um, moderate protein to a higher level of protein in, in each case. What we find is that there's no significant difference in live weight gain over the winter or no response to the additional protein over and above barley. Okay, now the caveat to this is that the silage quality was, was good here and the crude protein in the silage, as I said, was moderate to high. If the silage digestibility and our protein is low, you will get a response to protein inclusion with barley. But in this case, again, our, I suppose our target is good quality grass silage and then you can have feed cost savings. What about suckler bull weanlings? These animals have a, have a high growth potential. Will they respond to protein over and above what's in barley? So again, we have our control ration here, which is a barley-based ration containing 92% barley, 5% molasses, and 2.5% minerals and vitamins. We add in soybean meal then, and we compare the performance of a suckler a bull weanlings offered grass silage ad libitum and two kilograms of concentrate per head per day. The crude protein in the ration on a dry matter basis was 10.7 versus 12.2. We found a tendency for a higher growth rate in this case with the higher uh, protein ration, but the response was small, about 60 grams per day. There was no difference in silage dry matter intake and no difference in feed conversion ratio. 
So our conclusion here is that even with suckler bulls, the growth response from adding protein to barley was small. But again, the context here, and that's very important, is the grass silage was relatively good and the protein in the grass silage was moderate, at least moderately high. What about energy then? Um, as we've seen in the previous slides, it's really an energy story rather than a protein story And when you talk about feeding beef cattle. In this slide, uh, we're comparing uh, barley as our energy source versus soya hulls, uh, and we're talking about feeding weanling bulls in, in this case. So our constant two concentrates here, we have a barley-based uh, ration containing 86% rolled barley, 6% soybean meal, 5% molasses, and 2.5% minerals and vitamins. And we essentially replaced the rolled barley and the soybean meal with soy hulls. And again, we compared the performance of these two rations uh, with, uh, with suckler bulls uh, offered about two kilograms fresh weight per day as a supplement to good quality grass silage offered at Libitum. What did we find? We, we found no difference in average daily gain, essentially identical, no difference in silage dry matter intake and no difference in feed conversion ratio. So our conclusion here is that soya hulls had an equivalent feeding value to roll barley. Now people may be surprised by this because if we look at the, the feed tables, soya hulls has an inferior feeding value to barley in the, somewhere in the order of about 10%. But under the conditions of this experiment, uh, there was no difference in performance between the barley and the soya hulls. So we're back to concentrate ration and greeting composition. Does it matter? Um, it's not important provided the ration is formulated to the same net energy and protein levels per kilogram dry matter, okay? The key issue though is assigning correct energy and protein values to the individual feed ingredients. So once we know the feeding value of the ingredient in the feeding, uh, on, within the context of the feeding uh, regime operated, then uh, we, can, we can formulate uh, accordingly and there should be no difference in performance. So in conclusion then, uh, due to compensatory growth at pasture, there's little point in overfeeding weanlings during the indoor winter feed, uh, period. Our target winter growth rate is somewhere in the order of 0.5 to 0.6 kilograms per day. Again, bear in mind that animals growing too slowly will not compensate sufficiently. So we need to be achieving uh, somewhere in the order of this target. Concentrate supplementation level depends on silage uh, dry matter digestibility. Okay, the poorer the quality silage, the more concentrates we have to feed. And again, energy is the most important nutrient in concentrate feedstuffs or beef cattle. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks very, very much, Mark, for a very clear and focused presentation. Viewers, please remember that you can ask questions on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Uh, click, click on the Q&A tab, write in your questions, and push the, your return button. Um, we will have uh, questions following the second presentation, but maybe just one or two questions relating to yours, uh, Mark. Um, it, it, the importance of silage and of testing farmer silage, is this being done on farm? Uh, probably not to the degree we would like, Michael. Um, a test is relatively inexpensive when you consider the potential benefits that one can achieve from, uh, I suppose, using the results optimally. So again, we can be over or under feeding. For example, in the context of feeding weanlings, we can be easily over or under feeding, depending on the nutritive value of the silage. So we can be wasting concentrates by overfeeding or not achieving our targets and losing money in the long term, as you outlined in your introduction, um, by not making the targets early in life when the animal is relatively efficient. Okay, okay. And just one other question. Is there a benefit to front loading meals rather than feeding, feeding a flat rate throughout the whole winter period to weanlings? Um, we have probably more research in this area of finishing cattle, but we, had, we have one study with, with weanlings where we saw no, no benefit um, to, to front loading over. In fact, if you looked at performance over the actual winter period, it was better to feed a constant rate over the full winter rather than front loading. And there's definitely, uh, you would definitely not backload. Okay. So as the guideline would be to feed a constant rate, ideally feed a constant rate over the full winter. Okay, and, and just, just if we were talking about finishers, would that, that would be different, would it? Would, is there an advantage in front loading? Um, let's say that there's no advantage, so you have an option. So you could have a labor saving, uh, uh, you could have labor saving. So for example, if you wanted to reduce labor by feeding concentrates 
earlier on rather than later. So you reduce one extra job on the farm. Does, you, could, you could possibly front load in that case. Okay, 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 okay. Thanks very much, Mark. Thank you. Okay, our second presenter this evening is Martina Harrington. Martina is a bee specialist with Chagisks and, and Martina managed the Chagisk Irish Farmers Journal Better Farm Beef Programme. Um, Martina worked for a good number of years as a beef and technology dry stock advisor with Chagisk in County Wexford. Martina is an agricultural science graduate from UCD and in more recent, more recent years she obtained a master's in rural environmental conservation management. Martina is originally from a dairy and beef farm just outside Borough County Offaly and she is now farming part-time with her partner and his family on their beef farm in County Wicklow where they run a dairy calf beef system. Martina has an 18 to 20 minute presentation. The title of her paper is Steps Farmers Can Take to Improve the Performance of Beef Weanlings Over Their First Winter Indoors. I'm now going to hand you over to Martina. Thanks for that, Michael. Um, okay, my presentation should take about 15 to 20 minutes and it's going through all the, other, all the other factors, I suppose, that you have to take into consideration to obtain that 0.6 kilos per head per day over that first winter. So if we look at performance, for the most part when farmers are thinking of performance, they really are thinking of that diet. So that's what Mark has gone through. But the other factors that have to take into consideration is the environment that those animals are going to be in for that 120 day, 130 day, 150 day winter, whatever that is going to be. They also need to take into consideration the health of those animals and what housing practices were put in place for those animals at the start of the winter. So I suppose performance is not all about diet. And, you know, in 2012, 2013, Chagas carried out a, a, an experiment on 18 farms across the country. And they did exactly what Mark was talking about. They did a silage analysis on those farms and then they balanced up those um, silages with meal so that you had a constant level of energy and protein into the diet. And then the way those animals two weeks into housing and two months after housing to see what was the average daily gain. And what they were looking at is across the whole farms, an average daily gain of 0.38, but there was a huge range in the, in the gain across the farms from 0.07 to 0.68. So if we look at this graph here and look at farmer number one, 59 DMD silage, so not great quality silage, but he balanced up for, with, for that silage with two and a half kilos of meal and he had an average daily gain of 0.64. So then if we come and we look at farmer number 10, and he had 74 DMD silage, so very good quality silage, and balanced that up with 1.75 kilos of meal. But his performance, if we look at it here, was only 0.14. And for anybody on the call that was feeding, that level of feeding wouldn't be expecting that their animals are only doing 0.14. So when it was investigated, it was actually came down to the fact that the, the shed was overstocked with cattle and the ventilation in the shed was very poor. So the only reason the farmer knew this was he actually went and he weighed the stock. So if we were going to put a cost on that, we'd say 0.5 kilos is what the difference was on those farms for, for a 140 day winter. That's 70 kilos. And if we put a value of two euro, you can argue that up and up and down just for round figures, that's 140 euros per animal. So this farmer's animals were worth 140 euros a head more than farmer number 10. And that wasn't down to his feeding, it was purely down to the conditions that those animals were in in that shed. And it could have been down to anything else, it could have been down to, to health either. So I suppose it does point out the fact that it's not all about feeding it to, to get your 0.6 kilos and the, it highlights the importance of weighing those cattle. And now with the, the scales that you can rent from any of the, the merchants under the, the beep scheme, you can weigh your own animals and see where they are. And ICBF technicians can come out and weigh your cattle. But it is a good investment um, to see what are your animals performing or how are they performing over that first winter. So I suppose we really do need to start at housing of these animals. And what we want to be looking at here is minimizing the stress on these animals as much as possible. So what we'd be looking at is if you set your housing date, have your animals well weaned. So you want to minimize the stress. You're not putting the stress of weaning these animals, taking them away from the mother and then putting them into a shed that they've never been in before. So have your animals well weaned before they come into the shed and have them on meal, one to two kilos of meal before they come in. So they're not taking a change over from coming from a grass-based diet onto meals and forages. 
if you can feed them if you have cattle inside in the shed or cows or anything like that and you can give them a bit of of silage to get them used to it all the better make sure that your shed is prepared when they come in it's clean it's disinfected and if you're talking about bedding that there's good area of loose bedding there that those animals can just go in and lie down as much as possible try to house them on on a dry day group your animals according to size like so that'll help your management later on in in the in the housing time don't mix any animals of different ages have your silage fed out and the advantage of that is the animals will come up their nose through the feeding barrier and they'll get used to coming out and feeding leave them housed for the day and feed your your meal later in the evening and all of this is in line with keeping them under stress on the animal you know that there's not any sudden changes and you don't get that huge hit when animals come into a shed so once you have your animal housed then you're looking at the environment that these animals are in and when we're talking about environment what we're talking about is what ventilation is in the shed what kind of lion space is there what kind of feed area have the and have they enough water so if you're looking at what is good ventilation so when you walk into a shed good ventilation means that there's enough air moving around in that shed to remove any gases odors dust or bacteria and it should also remove the, the moisture and the heat that the animals generate in that shed and it needs to be effective on a calm day as well as a windy day you can't be expecting uh, wind outside to, to, to perform your ventilation for you so if you look in Ireland, what we're it's based on is the, the stack effect. And what that basically is, is you have your cold air coming in here through your inlets, you have your animals in here in your shed, that they're heating up the air, the hot air rises and it goes out through this outlet here. So what you need then is to make sure that the outlet is big enough for the air to move through. So if you move over here and just see on the right hand side, you're looking at what are the recommendations. The recommendation is that you have 0.1 meters squared for every animal that's in your shed to allow enough outlet for that air to pass up through. And then you need the cold air coming in here underneath so you have circulation. And that basically the rule of thumb on that is that this inlet area is twice the amount of your outlet area and that allows for good movement of air throughout your shed and the second or the third part of it is the pitch on your roof so what you want here is a lot of older sheds you see them they're very low pitch maybe eight to ten uh, degrees so what we're looking at in new sheds is that they're 15 degrees in you're talking about these a-shaped uh, sheds and in your mono pitch shed then you're looking at about from 12 to 15 degrees and that's to allow the movement of air through your shed and a good reference document for for people is the SIs the department specification and anybody has built a shed under the grant system will have seen these so it's a good record it's a good reference document you simply go onto the department site and you'll see it there it's si 101 so that's basically your ventilation so that's what the the principles behind it so how do you know if you have good ventilation in your shed if you walk into your shed and you look up and you see cobwebs on on the roof or the galvanizer is rusty or the timber is black that means that there's uh, not enough movement of air in your shed if you've no stock in it and if you have stock into it and you walk into that shed like on a cold winter's day and you walk in and it's really warm and stuffy again there's not enough air moving around that shed so you have a problem or if you can smell ammonia in the shed you have an issue so if you answer and yes to any of those questions well then you need to investigate and go back to you what is the outlet in your shed what is the inlet and what are the slopes and there are re ways and easier means of correcting these. If you look at it here, this is a farmer who had an issue with ventilation. He basically took down all the galvanized sheeting that he had on the shed and he put up space boarding and he had um, space sheeting in the roof. Another one here, round roof shed. How do you get ventilation into that? He raised every second sheet on the, on the shed to get enough of an outlet for his stock. And the same thing here is one of our better farms. He had an issue with ventilation. I just basically knocked out two rows of blocks here in his shed. He had his outlet and that solved the problem for him. So there are easy solutions. It's just a matter of knowing that you have a problem and then finding the solution to it. And I suppose that's one side of it is, is the ventilation and the movement, but you don't want too much movement in your shed either or where you have drafts. And where we've walked on, to, gone into farms and seen where, like when you're standing there and we often maybe have, have shoes on us and maybe a pair of jeans, you go into a shed and there's a, a huge breeze coming in from one end of the shed. But if you're wearing wellies or waterproofs, but a lot of people would be doing in the wintertime if you're feeding cattle, you're not going to feed, feel that draft in the shed. 
So you need to go in with light, uh, footwear, light uh, trousers on you and see, can you feel any drafts? And if there is a draft there, you can remove them. Again, it's the same better farmer here. The prevailing wind was coming into the shed. He had calves in here. So we just put a bit of stock boarding on the shed and that solved his problem. So he comes down now in the morning, all his cattle are lying in behind um, this stock boarding if he has a, has a breezy day. Same thing here on another shed, there was breeze coming in here under the door. Again, simple solutions, bit of stock boarding and, and that solves the problem. So that's your, your ventilation and your drafts inside in your shed. So the next part that you're looking at is what level have your, are your animals comfortable in your shed? So have they enough lying space on it? And these are the recommendations from Chagas and the department. So if you're looking at a 275 kilo animal, which would be your kind of your lighter dairy bred animal going into your shed, you need between 1.2 and 1.5 meters squared for that animal to lie down comfortably. If you're looking at your larger, maybe more your suckler weanlands going into your shed, you're looking at between two and two and a half meters squared. And what I'd be saying is over your 35, if, you, if you're looking at the, there's kind of between 1.5 and 2, if for every 50 kilos that that animal increases, increase your lion area by 0.2, and that'll dare, thereabouts work, work out. So if we're looking at a typical size pen here, and you can see it here on the right. This is a normal span, 15 foot 9 span. It's 5 meters wide, which is basically a 14 foot 6 slat with a foot on either side. And if you take the measurements of that, you're, you're ending up with a pen size of 23 meters squared. So again, we're going, we're looking at our animal. He's 330 kilos going in, or, or she's 330 kilos going in. But that animal is going to grow, hopefully, over the period of time that it's in its shed. And if you're talking about your 0.6 kilos, it's going to, to over per head per day, it's going to grow over 70 kilos. So it might go in at 330 kilos, but it's going to come out at 400 kilos here. So you have to decide then at what weight or what area are you going to allocate for this animal? And some people will be killing maybe cattle at Christmas time and they might be moving weanlands from one pen to another. So they can go in at, at the, the 1.5, 1.6. But what I've done here is taken them at the exit weight of 400 kilos and divided it by two. So if I'm looking at this pen here, an average size pen, I can house 11 and a half animals. So I have to decide, am I going to house 11 or am I going to house 12 in that pen? So now that's the, the, what the pen will hold as regard lion space. But then I have to feed those animals. So again, we come back to the recommended uh, space allowances for these animals. And I suppose if you look at it here, your, your 225 or your 300 millimeters per animal, what you're looking at there is if you're looking at a diet feeder and you're feeding to um, appetite. So your meal is mixed up in your silage so your animals can come up at any time during the day and eat. But for most cases in Ireland, we're looking at this type of a scenario where you have your silage is fed ad lib out to the front of your, your shed and your meal is thrown on top of that. So your animals all have to be able to come up at the same time and eat. And if your animals have to do that, you're looking at between uh, 0.4 and 0.5 of a meter for your animals to be able to feed comfortably. And then you're going to have to consider looking at what type of uh, barrier system have you. Are you set up like this or are you more free where your animals can come out and they're only feeding under a bar? So you have to take that into consideration. So if we come along then and we've calculated our line area and we look at our feed space. So again, you're going back into your 4.6 meters is what the length of your feed face is if you're only feeding along here to the front. Your weanlands require between 0.4 and 0.5 of a meter, so we'll go halfway between 0.45. So if we divide one into the other, you might be able to house 11 to 12 animals in it, but you're only going to be able to feed 10. So it's a consideration, especially where these pens have widened. You have people going in with 14 foot four six or 16 foot six slats and maybe not having um, a meal truck at the back of it where they're going to be able to feed extra animals that are able to fit into these wider pens so that's the other part of it that you have to take into consideration and I suppose if we don't want to, to, to go in and measure up with these pens, you can use your eye. If you go down uh, at any time during the day and you can see all of your animals are lying down comfortably, well, then you know you have enough space inside in your shed. And the same thing if you're going feeding your animals and you look, you come along, you put your, your ration out in front. And if all those animals are able to come up and comfortably feed, well, then you're fine. But the chances are there's one or two animals there that are not able to come up and feed. And then 
those are usually because they're hierarchy within cattle those are usually the ones that are at the back all of the time and they're the ones that are going to if you're weighing your pen of animals they're the ones that are going to bring back down that average weight gain over the winter and they're the ones that are going to be hanging around on your farm for much longer i suppose the other one that's there then is that your renans require between 20 and 25 litres of water a day. So you need to have good water supply in your shed. And how you know that is if you go out and you have constantly a queue of animals up for the water bowl, well, then you have an issue. There's not enough water in that. And you need to be able to clean those out and they need to be freely accessible so that you're not having stale stagnant water or feces inside in them. So if you have an issue, then you need to, to identify it and then put a solution in place. So I suppose the last cog in, in the wheel um, of your animals uh, performing at this point six kilos is your a health plan and an appropriate health plan for, for your weanlands. So what does that look like? For to control, what you need to control, I suppose, in your weanlands, you need to control your lungworm, your stomach worm. Um, there is uh, immunity will develop over years, uh, over two years or so to these. You need to control liver fluke and rumen fluke if they're present on your farm. You have your external parasites like your lice, and then you have your viruses. Now, this really is a presentation in itself, so I'm just going to go through a couple of tips in these. I suppose with your lungworm, what we're kind of advocating is you do a pre-housing dose. And what that is, is where you go in and you use maybe an ivermectin two to three weeks before you, you house your animals. You kill off all of the worms that's there. You're, uh, there's a persistency in that. So there's any worms that they're picking up in the meantime is being killed off as well. So you have two to three weeks where you have no worm burden in those animals. And when they, they're, so that's given their, their lungs a chance to heal. So when they come in, they have no lung damage and they're able to deal with the more enclosed um, conditions of your shed. So you, you're reducing the stress on those animals. From your stomach worms, what you have to consider is these inhibited larvae. And what they are is basically your stomach worms later in the year, they know it's gone later in the year, they're not going to be able to produce. So what they do is they insist and they're taken in by the animal and they insist in the, in the rumen and they just sit there. And what your levamazoles, so your yellow drenches or some of your white drenches, your bendamidazoles, they won't control them. So what you want to be using is your, your ivermectin or some of the white drenches that do kill the, the inhibited larvae. So you need to read the label and talk to your vet um, to control those. And the other big thing is, is resistance. Again, another topic in itself, but you have to, to see uh, is your um, dosing regime working on your farm? And the way, one way of checking that is if you're killing animals on the farm, if there's if you're after dosing, has your, your uh, regime worked? Or you can take some fecal egg samples and see if you have dose, it's a, to call a drench test. If that's working, you can tell if, if the products are working on your farm. The other one then, I suppose, is your fluke. And I suppose with the summer that we're after having this year, a warm, wet summer, the, the, the possibility of you having a high fluke levels on farms is there. But most farmers will know what level of fluke that they have on the farm. It's a fluky farm, if it's a dry farm. And you can use your beef health check reports, which are come from your factory when you kill animals, or you can log on to ICBF and see it under the AHI tab. There's no immunity bills to liver fluke. So you do, if you do have them on your farm, you do have to control them. But it's a complicated situation in that there's three um, stages of, of fluke, your early immature, your immature and your adult fluke. And it works over a 12 week life cycle. So from when the, the fluke comes into the liver here, it takes it 10 to 12 weeks before it comes here to the bile duct and it's laying eggs and it's causing damage in all of that period of time. And then there's seven active ingredients to control that fluke. So, you know, it, it's, you have to know what products you're using and at what stage it's killing the fluke. Um, and a lot of the, the products only kill the adult fluke. So it's not hitting anything that's doing the damage here. It's only hitting the fluke when it comes to the, the bile duct and it's actually laying, leg, laying eggs. Um, one of the big considerations that people take when you're talking about a flucoside is the withdrawal period. But for weanlands, that's not an issue. And the other thing to bear in mind is the products that kill all of the early immature flukes, uh, the triclobendazoles, there is fairly widespread um, resistance to those. So you have to make sure that they are actually, if you're using them on your farm, that they're actually working. So it is a conversation to have with your vet or your advisor as to what products that you're using and what stages of fluke are to killing. 
The other one is rumen fluke, and I suppose this year it's raised its head again because we've had um, faecal egg sampling been taken through the BPS scheme. It's present on most harms, but for the most part, it's not causing an effect on performance. But the only control for your, your rumen fluke is your xanil and your levofast diamond. And the big worry here is that if resistance does build to oxyclozenide, that you're not going to have like fluke and other six products or active ingredients that can come in and kill it. So what we would be advocating is you treat for everything else. If you still have an issue or if you took fecal egg samples and not that it just says it's present, that there's a high level of rumen fluke on it, talk to your vet and go in and control that, that rumen fluke at that stage, but not to be using xanil or Levenfast diamond unless you actually have a reason to use it. Um, and then, you know, we're having a real push here at trying to see is your dosing regime working on your farm? So if you've gone in and you've dosed for your lungworm, your stomach worm and your fluke, you want to check has that worked? So the, your beef health check we talked before comes out from, from the factory when you kill animals or if you're not, if you're killing them through an abattoir that's not signed up to the beef health check, you can check with those. And the other big thing that you can do is take a faecal egg sample after Christmas. So that'll basically tell you if there's any eggs in, in the feces from your lungworm, from your stomach worm, or from your, your fluke. So if, you're, if your regime hasn't worked, you'll know at that stage. And the other thing, and I'm not going to go through too much on this, is your lice. You have your two types of lice, your biting and your sucking lice. For the most part in Ireland, what we have is, is sucking lice. Your treatments are your macrocytic lactones. So they're your ivermectins, basically, and your pyrethroids. So they're the spot-ons. If you're dealing with your biting lice, because they're only eating the hair and the skin on the outside, you're going to have to use a poron or a spot-on. If you're dealing with sucking lice on your farm, your macrocytic lactones will usually lower. You're normally going to have to go in with two treatments because you're going to have to deal with the adults and then the eggs that are coming on, which take about two to three weeks in the life cycle. So for all intents and purposes, you are going to have to do two, if not three, um, hits on your, on your lice. And the last thing then to consider is your viruses. So they're going to cause you your pneumonia and that can knock back your performance in your animals. And I suppose in Ireland, what we're looking at in younger animals is your RSV, PI3 and Manheimia, if it's present on your farm and your IBR. But you need to vaccinate if you're using, uh, vaccinating for your Manheimia, it's a two shot dose and you need to make sure that you're giving yourself plenty of time for the onset of immunity to build here so you're talking probably eight weeks before housing if you're getting caught and you're coming in to, to housing you can use an intranasal it's a faster onset of immunity but it lasts for a shorter period of time and i suppose the other thing on, on your your lungworm versus your viruses if you put animals into a shed and you do treat for lungworm and you have coughing later on maybe three weeks or a month after housing check and make sure that it's, it's um, lungworm that you're dealing with and not a virus. A lot of people come back and say, well, you know, have I got resistance in lungworms? But in actual fact, it's a virus. So, you know, to get performance on your animals at those 0 0.6 kilos per head per day, it is a multi-pronged approach. And you are looking at your nutrition, you are looking at your environment, you are looking at your health, and you are looking at your housing practices. So if you fall down on any one of those, you can go back to that graph where you could lead, instead of having your 0 0.6, you might have 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, or 0.4. And that's a big cost to the system in what Michael already said is a very tight margin system. So, thank you. Thanks very much, Martina, uh, for a very clear and highly practical uh, presentation. Um, it was fantastic to see you highlighting a number of simple and often inexpensive tips which farmers can take on their farm to improve conditions around their houses, uh, to minimize drafts, or to create greater ventilation in their, in their, in their sheds. And I suppose it's, it's amazing the innovation, the simple things that farmers can do to address problems. Everything doesn't involve spending a lot of money. It's true. A lot of it is attention to detail. Um, there's a, a number of questions uh, coming through there now. Uh, most of them at this point are for Mark, but I'm sure there's a heap of them going to come your way now as well, Martina. So just to give, um, uh, the, uh, the viewers a chance to put, put a few more questions together. I just have one or two for you there now, uh, Martina, just to uh, uh, make sure you, do, you, you keep going here. 
Uh, question, are farmers weighing their cattle in order to monitor animal performance? And when you are weighing your cattle, do you need to um, weigh all cattle in your house? Again, I suppose it's like the silage testing. It's not as much as what we would like. Um, but there are a certain number of farmers that are, measure, are weighing cattle. It's a really good practice to get into to see what level of performance are you getting. And we've had lads that have started to, to weigh cattle and actually found when they were weighing pens of cattle that in particular parts of the shed, the animals weren't performing as well as in other areas. And when they investigated it, it was down to maybe a draft coming around the corner or maybe that the ventilation in that part of the shed wasn't great so I suppose if you don't ideally weigh all the cattle in, in the shed you're going to get a better knowledge of what's happening on your farm but if you don't weigh the whole pen and maybe weigh uh, pens around your shed so you're kind of getting an idea of what exactly is happening in there okay okay and um See, when you go onto a farm where animals are underperforming, are there two or three key things that you're looking for when you're visiting that farm? Yeah, usually, and I suppose, you know, when you started off in, in the job, you really were looking at the, the nutrition side of things to see, well, was there silage analysis on the farm? And then did the diet match up to where it needed to be? But you do need to go into the shed and stand within that shed and see what is the ventilation like? You know, can you see any traces that there is poor ventilation? And one great thing is actually one of those smoke machines where you can go in, you can plug it into the shed, especially when animals are in it, and you can see the movement of the smoke in the shed and you can tell what level of ventilation is there. But usually if you walk, can walk into a shed and it, it's not warm and it's not stuffy, um, you know, well then there's fairly good ventilation in that shed. Okay, okay. And uh, we might get Mark back in there now as well. Uh, Mark, can you switch back on? Yeah, Michael, back. And just, um, Martina, the study you showed at the very start of your presentation, where you showed that uh, that was done on farms where, uh, and uh, different factors, and even where the nutrition was right, there was still underperformance in certain farms. Is it yeah. To highlight that again, Martina. In, 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 yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a very, I suppose, powerful type of, of, of slide. Um, and it, like for the farmer involved, like he was shocked when he went back and he's seen that, you know, his animals, he was 74 DMD silage and 1.75 kilos and only gaining 0.14. You know, it was, it was a huge, um, I suppose, eye opener for him on the farm. But it's also like if you look at some of the other farms here, 0 0.23, 0 0.21. And this is where a nutritionist went in onto the farm and developed up diets. Like, so it was well balanced. You know, all of those animals on the farm were getting the same level of energy and the same level of protein going in. So it was external factors to that. So it does show the importance of making sure that the environment is right, that the health is right, and that the animals aren't stressed when they're going into the shed that can have a hangover okay 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 um just uh, there's a number of questions here relating to minerals i might hand that over to you mark the importance of minerals for weanling cattle uh, yes, uh, Michael. Yeah, in, I, I suppose I should have mentioned it that in all the rations that we're talking about there, uh, minerals, minerals are included. So beef, beef cattle minerals are included. Um, where animals received no concentrates, mineral was applied on the silage. So it was, uh, there was a top dressing. Um, so again, um, minerals, are, minerals are critical. So again, no more than energy and protein, animals have a requirement for minerals and vitamins as well, and we must uh, formulate our diet to meet those requirements. Yeah, and I know we're speaking specifically about weanings tonight, but often the question is often asked as well about the importance of minerals for finishing cattle. Have they a place? Are they important? Of course, again, uh, animals have, uh, again, the, sa the same thing applies. Um, and they have a requirement for minerals and vitamins, and it needs to be part of the diet. So you balance your diet accordingly to, to the requirements of the animal. Okay, thanks, Mark. There's another question here. Again, Mark, you're on the podium again from Neil. Regarding the weanlings at pasture, was the stocking rate low or was it <coughs> standard rate? I.e., did the weanlings have access to excess pasture? And it was related yeah, to we would, uh, yeah, we would, the, the weanlings would be managed according to our, I, I suppose, our typical blueprint. So a rotational grazing system um, going into moderate, moderately high covers, grazing down to about five to six centimeters uh, post-grazing sward height, and then moving on to the next paddock. So they had uh, adequate allowances of a uh, good quality grazed grass at all times. Okay. 
Okay, okay. We have five more minutes tops, lads, just to keep within our time frame of an hour. But we'll just keep going with the questions here. There's a question from uh, Michael. Uh, is there much of a cost difference between barley and saya hulls? Um, I, did, uh, I can address that, Mark. If, if yeah, you, sure. Yeah. If you wish, yeah. Yeah, uh, please. Yeah, as as it stands at the moment, there's probably barley is the single um, is probably the lowest cost feed ingredient going into feeds over the last um, since around the middle of August. Feed ingredient prices, including grain, have shot through the roof, and the likes of maize, soya hulls are all up probably fifty euros a ton. Um, so I, I would say that um, a rolled barley in, in most cases is probably one of the cheapest, if not the cheapest feed ingredient available there this year. And you'd also be supporting the, the Irish tillage grower by feeding it. Um, but, uh, so that, that's just one comment there. Uh, David has a question. What protein is required uh, to, uh, TMR, what, uh, in a TMR diet to dairy bull weanlings? What protein is required TMR to dairy bull weanlings from David? Mark. So, yeah, we'd be saying somewhere in the order of probably 13, 13 and a half percent uh, or 13 and a half percent crude protein on a dry matter basis. OK, um, we'll get to you now in a minute, Martina. Um, Derek, uh, just a question here from Derek. Weanling heifers for breeding in mid to late April is the higher daily gain from higher concentrate input to be 23 kilos heavier at breeding, having a positive effect on heifers cycling? Sorry, that's the way I'm reading it there. Again, it's relating to one of your uh, trials you put up there, Mark, uh, where there was a difference of 23 kilos. Sorry, uh, I'll just read that maybe again. So, just, uh, where is that gone? Sorry, you seem to have misplaced. Yeah, it, no, it's okay. I, I think I got the gist of it. Um, yes, yes is the answer. I mean, target, uh, target, target weighted breeding is absolutely critical to to initiate. Uh, uh, to, to initiate the whole reproductive cycle. So for, for puberty to kick in, there must be threshold weights that have to be reached. And then obviously great, greater feeding will help, help achieve that, particularly for the breeding herd. I know would say, for example, with a lot of our late maturing breeds, achieving these targets is very difficult on our standard, uh, we call it winter feeding regime for, for weanlings. We need to feed them breeding heifers at a higher rate than we'd be feeding our, our, uh, our typical weanlings. So it's a different animal. It, it needs to be probably, the nutrition for that needs to be tailored towards, towards the, the, the reproductive performance more so. Okay. And uh, Martina, a question here from Podrick. Can we rely on the beep fluke test to decide if we should dose? Yeah, it, it, it's probably one that has come up quite a bit in, in um, discussion groups. I suppose no is probably the shortest answer in that a lot of those fecal tests were taken early on in the year. And if you go back to the life cycle, it takes 12 weeks before when the, from when the fluke enters the liver to when it's actually passing out eggs. So you don't know if you're after taking a do or if you're after taking a sample within that period of time. So you really would be looking at it, kind of the history of the farm. If you have fluke on your farm, um, the chances are you're go you are going to have to dose every year. So if it was me, I'd be looking at putting your cattle into the shed and maybe two to three weeks after, if you, if you don't want to dose unless you have a fecal egg sample, take a fecal egg sample at that stage. But if you know you have um, fluke on your farm, um, if you have a fluky farm, well, then you need to go in and treat, for, treat your animals. Yeah. And another one here from Neil. If you have a fecal test done on one random animal and it shows some issues, is it correct to assume all animals may require dosing? Not necessarily, especially if they're older animals. Like, you know, like I say, if you're talking about older animals, maybe with uh, stomach worms or anything like that, there might be something particular to that animal. So you'd like to have where you have um, a sample from a number of animals on the farm. But you can go in, say, for a rumen fluke or something like that. If it was quite high, you go in and you dose that animal um, uh, because we don't want to build resistance to doxyclazonides. But you can go in and investigate it further. Okay, and another one for you, Martina there. Tim wants to know is, what would you recommend to treat wing, ringworm in weanlings recently housed and showing symptoms? Any, any idea on ringworm? No, don't. We, we, shall we can dig that out and, and, and get yeah, that? Yeah, we can put it up onto the system, yeah. No problem at all. And um, uh, another one there, recommended period between vaccination and housing? 
yeah, well, you, what you really want is the onset of immunity. So it depends on what your, your product that you're vaccinating with, but you'd be kind of looking for two to three weeks to allow that immunity build up before you put your animals into the shed. A lot of that will probably be covered tomorrow night by um, Doreen Carlin in her presentation yeah. um, tomorrow evening. And just, just one more question, and then we'll have to wind up, uh, uh, folks. Um, Seamus here, uh, is, do you rec recommend clipping backs and heads on cattle? Yeah, for like it's a good idea where you have cattle that are going to be in in sheds, and especially older cattle. When you clip along their back, what it'll do? It's it's not that it'll it'll um do anything in regards to lice or anything like that, but it allows the air to come off their back and it leaves them cooler, like you know. So you have more of an evaporation off their back, and it leaves the animals more comfortable, I suppose. Okay, sorry, folks, we're not going to get around to all questions, but they will be answered, and the answers will be put up on the. Uh, the, the conference uh, webpage. Um, I wish to thank all viewers for your active contribution and I hope that you got something from our webinar this evening. May I remind you all uh, to register and tune in for tomorrow evening's webinar, which again starts at 8 p.m. The focus tomorrow, of tomorrow night is on improving the health and welfare of beef cattle. This webinar will be chaired by Dr. Connor McLoon uh, with UCD School of Veterinary Medicine. And the presenters are Bernadine Early from Chagas Grange and Dr. Doreen Carnan, two, two excellent speakers. Um, just to wind up again, I'd like to thank both of our speakers tonight, Mark and Martina. Um, and I suppose to wind up, to, uh, achieving top weanling performance in the first winter involves getting a number of elements right. It involves getting the nutrition right, health right, housing right, right and husbandry right. And it comes down to seeking advice, and there's plenty of advice available through your local Chagas offices and through uh, equally there's a lot of ag graduates working with in the, in the feed trade and, uh, and with merchants and co-ops around the country. And it comes down to attention to detail at farm level. Um, with that, I'd like to uh, call, uh, call it a night and thank you very much. Thank Good. you. Thank you.